This week on Christian World News, an explosive growth of Christians in a country where 99% of the population is Muslim. And an education in hope, how Christian missionaries are helping secure a future for Burmese refugees. Plus, students from around the world come to study in the U.S. These friends are waiting to welcome them. And welcome to Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. George Thomas is on assignment. It's an area that was once hostile to the gospel, but now an amazing revival is moving through the northernmost reaches of Africa. And as George Thomas tells us in this exclusive report, tens of thousands of Muslims are turning to Christ. These images of North Africans worshiping have never been seen before on television. As the sun sets over the Mediterranean Sea, Muslims across this part of Africa are converting to faith in Jesus Christ in record numbers. What God is doing in North Africa, all the way from actually Mauritania to Libya, is unprecedented in history of missions. Tino Kahush, a graduate of Regent University, has spent years traveling the region to document the transformation. I have the privilege of recording testimonies and listening to first-hand stories of men and women all ages where they can be sitting in a room and see the appearance, the presence of God appear to them in reality. It's like a vision. They can, some of them gave me stories of they carry a conversation. It's not just a, a light that appears. His interviews confirm what experts say is a profound move of God in the predominantly Muslim nations of Mauritania, Western Sahara, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, and Tunisia. Sometimes I feel jealous. How come is visiting the Muslim world at this time and age where we don't hear that happening in the traditional Christian community? From the shores of Casablanca in Morocco to Tripoli, Libya, experts say the growth of Christianity, especially in the last 20 years, has been unprecedented. And nowhere is that growth more evident than in the North African nation of Algeria. Pastor Salah leads one of the largest churches in Algeria, where 99% of the population is Muslim. He says every new Christian in his church came from a Muslim background. Some 1,200 believers attend the church. Men like Zino, who was invited to attend Pastor Salah's church by a friend. Others like Farhat speak of miraculous encounters. He says he was illiterate and couldn't read the Bible when he accepted the Lord. Then God made a change. Even though Algeria is overwhelmingly Muslim, the government has given Protestant churches the freedom to register their congregations. It is the first Muslim Arab government who recognized officially churches from Islam. Yusuf Kurahmani is a leading Algerian pastor. He says the government will harass and intimidate Christians from time to time, but the level of persecution is nothing like it was 20 years ago. God has given us many opportunities to witness at the police stations, at the courts. And actually, once I, I, I went to the police station and they gave me 45 minutes to speak about Jesus. Just imagine yourself, there are all Muslims. City you will tell us about Jesus, please. But Algeria and the countries of North Africa weren't always open to the gospel. Peter is a veteran missionary in these parts. You know, there's that parable, the sower went out to sow and his, the seed fell on uh, stony ground. This is North Africa. Uh, in those days was quite uh, resistant and stony. For security reasons, we've altered his voice and concealed his identity. The religion and the culture were unsympathetic to anything that was foreign and uh, Christianity was considered to be a the religion of the Europeans. 
Peter believes the arrival of satellite TV and the internet have dramatically changed people's perception of Christianity. Today in North Africa on, on TV you can hear uh, native Arab Christians talking about their faith who are mature Christians, answering questions, involved in debates. Emboldened by God's power, Algerian Christians are now on a mission to take the gospel to the four corners of the globe. God has put, put in our heart to be able to send 1,000 missionaries by the year 2025. And I really believe maybe one day America will end up with some Muslim converse missionaries coming to reach out to the Muslims there and other parts as well. George Thomas, CBN News, along the shores of the Mediterranean. Wow, so beautiful. Thanks, George. Great report. In Sudan, the Islamist government continues its attacks against Christians and black Africans in the Nuba Mountains. As Gary Lane tells us, the violence is part of President Omar al-Bashir's decades-long pursuit of ethnic and religious cleansing. Sudan's Nuba Mountains used to be a serene place, one where Muslims and Christians lived side by side in peace, eking out a living from farming. But this is their experience in 2015. For more than two decades, Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir has waged war against the people of the Nubas and South Kordofan state. Muslims and Christians alike have resisted his efforts to Arabize and Islamize them. They believe he sees them as infidels. He wants to kill them and seize their oil. Sudanese Christian human rights activist Namia Ibrahim Shaloka says many Americans mistakenly believe that fighting ended in the Nubas when South Sudan gained independence nearly three years ago. He says the opposite is true. The war against his people is escalating. Every day is daily air bombarding, destroying the school, even the facilities, health centers, churches and everything. According to the news service Nuba Reports, Sudan government bombings in the Nuba Mountains increased from 28 in November 2013 to at least 120 just two months later. Late last month, a barrage of 48 rockets hit a school and near the marketplace in the city of Kauda. While no one was killed, the Nubans were alarmed by Bashir's new preferred method of attack, parachute bombs. Parachute bombs are more deadly because they're much quieter and less noticeable when they fall from the sky. It's just like uh, totally focusing to destroy the life of the people and they target even the civilians, they don't focus in uh, anything else. This is the situation. Religious freedom advocate Tina Ramirez of the nonprofit group Hardwired says Sudanese President Bashir is at the heart of every Sudan conflict, from Darfur to the Nuba Mountains and the Blue Nile. The conflict is not between Muslims and Christians, it's between Bashir and his version of Islam that's extremely oppressive and everybody else in Sudan, and that includes South Sudan. So he's constantly um, pitting groups off of each other and instigating problems even in South Sudan. The International Criminal Court has issued a warrant against Bashir for war crimes and crimes against humanity. So far, the Sudanese president has avoided arrest and we're not doing anything to bring them in. So what can we do as the U.S.? As the church or as um, non-governmental organizations, we can come alongside the people of Sudan to ensure that they have the training to articulate true human rights and freedom and to have a constitution that really respects that for everyone. Without religious freedom, there will be no peace in Sudan. For Christians and Muslims alike, from Khartoum south to the Nuva Mountains. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Coming up, a school called Hope. How Christian missionaries are helping these migrant children get a better chance at a better life. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. 
Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. In the arid Chaco region of western Paraguay, indigenous tribes eke out a living raising livestock and cultivating small crops. But the children in one of those communities are creating a better future for themselves and their families. Latin America correspondent Carolina Martinez has more. Native people in this part of the Chaco had little access to education before 2001. Brazilian missionary Aurea Lobos has worked in Paraguay for 40 years. It hurt me so much because I used to come here to the community center, and I noticed the indigenous people were being discriminated against. I was especially sad that they had no access to school. That's what prompted the international Christian organization REACH, an acronym for Effective Aid to Children, to establish a school in Chaco, 200 miles from the capital, Asuncion. Today, the school teaches 180 children, half of them boarding students. One serious problem they must overcome is the lack of water. The school has five 16,000-gallon tanks, but that's not nearly enough when months go by without rain. So they have found that the best resource they have is prayer. We had a prayer vigil once with all the kids, both boarders and day students. We did it with the whole community. By dawn, it was raining. Their rich school not only helps children, two or three times a year, volunteer doctors and dentists, as well as nursing students, conduct site visits. For one day, the school becomes a hospital and pharmacy with free medicine for the whole community. One of the volunteers, soon to become a nurse, is a former rich school student herself. The only thing I can say is don't lose faith, and God will give you what you wish for. God answers prayer. I only asked him to give me a job, and he didn't just give me a job, but also the opportunity to study. He gave me more than what I asked for. The children who come to this school often come from dysfunctional homes and are victims of domestic violence, sexual abuse, malnutrition, and lack of affection. In their community, the highest ambition for girls is to become pregnant at 14 and live as concubines. But at REACH, they find a new life and new values. They study the Word of God, which is not only transforming the children, but also their parents. Change happens slowly, but every year we see how children mature. They're repeating the same things we told them. Girls say things like, no, I'm not going to just live with a man. I'm going to study, finish college, have a career, and I will get married. They already have their mind set on something. They have goals for their lives. It takes about $15,000 a month to maintain the rich school, including the cost of food, education, and living expenses. Until three years ago, all those costs were covered by the rich office in Spain. But because of the European economic crisis, they now only send three to $5,000 a month. The school could have to close its doors if it doesn't receive more financial support. Education is the most important thing for our country to improve, especially if the children learn about God. So what I say to others is become child sponsors to give these children a chance to grow and have a future. In Chaco, Paraguay, Carolina Martinez for CBN News. Thanks, Carolina. Well, parents worldwide want their children to have a good education and a bright future. 
But in some nations, it's hard enough just to stay alive. That's often the case for Burmese migrants living in Thailand. But as Lucille Toulousan reports, a school run by Christian missionaries there is changing the lives of thousands of children. For more than 10 years, the LP school has provided free education to Burmese child refugees. As an expression of his gratitude, former student Tunai O oh is now teaching in this school. LP taught me many things, and now I want to share what I learned with my own people. Elpis takes its name from the Greek word for hope. The ministry works to live up to its name with these children who escaped Burma's violence and extreme poverty. The Mui River runs between Burma and Thailand. Most of the undocumented migrants use this back door to get to Thailand. The Burmese parents bring their children to this northern part of Thailand, which is Mesot, believing that here their children can have a better life. Elpis co-founder Maria Amihan is overwhelmed at how God guided them through the years of helping illegal child migrants. They have faced eviction and threats to their lives. The Lord gave me a verse. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, says the Lord. And then your children will go back to their own land. And that is a promise that I'm holding until now. Trained by CBN's Asian Center for Missions, the ministry has grown to more than 300 students. In addition to lessons, students get lunch, which for most of them is their only complete meal for the day. Elpis provides shelter for the high school students. That helps protect these girls from prostitution or child labor. Piu Pue Hue almost missed out on this new life because her mother wanted her to work in Bangkok. She changed her mind after realizing Piu Pue Hue was the first member of their clan to ever graduate from elementary school. Now, Piu Pue Hue is the first Elpis graduate admitted to a prestigious Thai school. I want to be an interpreter and my hope is I want to share about God. I want to help the other children also. Hallelujah. Elpis teachers also share Christ's salvation and teach the children to read the Bible. Maria is happy to see them apply what they learned to their lives. She fondly recalls how one of the girls gave up the doll she won in their Christmas raffle so that Maria can have her own. She told me, teacher, I'm giving this to you. I said, how can you give this to me? I know you. I know your doll, that you have the big one. And she said, yeah, teacher, but you know what? I exchanged that for this Barbie doll because I want you to have this. And when asked why she did it, Teacher Maria loves us, and that is why I want to give her the Barbie doll. She never had one. I also learned that when we give much, we will also receive much. Just one example of how love sown by the Elpis missionaries is changing the lives of these children. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Mesot, Thailand. CBN presents The Transforming Word. Pat Robertson records powerful verses of health and healing. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. My youth is renewed like the eagles. A new DVD and audio CD set by Pat Robertson. The Transforming Word, verses for health and healing. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. 
Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's Word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, right, follow me. discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Every year, millions of students from all over the world come to study in the United States. And for some, being alone in an unfamiliar place can be difficult. That's why one organization is dedicated to serving them, aware that the little things they do can have a long-term impact. Myra Alejandro tells us more. Kurnifo is a popular guy at Virginia's Old Dominion University. He graduated some years ago. But walk around campus with him, and you stop every few minutes as he greets friends. He's the founder of Global Student Friendship, an organization that serves international students. When we moved to the U.S., I asked God what he wanted me to do here. I didn't have many things that I could give or share. The only thing that I could share was my love, attention, and commitment to serve others. As an international student himself, Kurnia knows the challenges these students face oceans away from home. They're some of the brightest in their fields. They arrive in the U.S. with their luggage and dreams of a promising career. But that's all they own in this new land. The majority of them don't even have any local connections to help them get settled. That's where Kurnia and Global Student Friendship come in. Kurnia arranged for a family to host me for a week and to introduce me to this university. We contacted him and he provided some furniture. It's not about furniture, but at least you feel more uh, like uh, somebody's looking after you. They do everything from providing furniture to calling utility companies they even set up social outings to help them become familiar with their new town. But Kurnia doesn't do this alone. There is a whole community serving international students. We like to meet them at the airport, find out what their needs are, and we want them to come into our home, so we mobilize the Christian community to open their homes to welcome internationals in. Kathy and Rich Hardison, they love international students. They open their home to these students year round. And now, they're in the process of building the Global Friendship House to assist even more international students and their families. It, it is the great commission that Jesus gave us to reach the nations and disciple them. Um, but we are the number one place in the world where students want to come to study. The latest figures show the number of international students hit a record high last year with over 820,000 enrolled in colleges and universities. Most come from China, India, and South Korea. But there's also been a large increase in students from Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil. Altogether, they're contributing nearly $25 billion to the U.S. economy through tuition and living expenses alone. American universities overall have alumni in nearly every country and territory in the world, increasing the potential impact of each student's experience while in the U.S. Christian in Iran is minority. I didn't have opportunity to communicate with them and know, know more about their beliefs. So it, it was a very uh, nice experience here communicating with uh, Christian people. And Korn is so nice to us. His work is uh, beyond the lines of um, religion or any caste and creed. The majority of these students only spend about two to six years in this country. It's a relatively short time, but it's long enough to establish long-term relationships. Oksana Nosova is one example of the long-term impact of this basic but crucial interactions. She lives in Russia now, but she comes to the U.S. during the summers to volunteer with international students. God had a plan when he brought me here all the way across the ocean, so I will meet him here. And then later he had a plan to use me so I could help other international students who will come here because I can totally relate to them. It's a very much like the ministry of Jesus. So we just say we're, we're um, turning foreigners into friends who become followers of Jesus. They will be the world leaders someday. They will be the future leaders in their countries. Global student friendship is sowing seeds here in America. 
hoping to shape the future of the world one relationship at a time. Myra Alejandra, CBN News. CBN presents The Transforming Word, Verses for Health and Healing, a new DVD and audio CD set by Pat Robertson. I'm going to teach you some of the principles I've learned as God has revealed them to me about how His kingdom works. The Transforming Word will show you how the Word of God can transform your life. You'll learn to experience God's miraculous kingdom and see how speaking the words of Scripture will bring power to your life and to those you love. I've also recorded selected verses for you that you can listen to, that you can memorize, and that you can speak aloud, so that you can see the transforming power of God at work in your life. Pat Robertson records powerful verses of health and healing. Oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my health. Get the transforming word. Available now. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, Miracles happen. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest. Life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. The Museum of the Bible, being built in Washington, D.C., will feature artifacts brought directly from the Holy Land. An agreement between the museum and Israeli Antiquities Authority will bring a selection of artifacts excavated in Israel for long-term display once it opens. Paul Strand tells us more from the nation's capital. It won't be ready for a couple of years, but construction of the world's largest Bible museum began with an act of destruction, ripping away at a building in the way. And for the first time, its designers put on display the finalized artwork of what the $400 million Museum of the Bible will actually look like. Our idea and our desire is to tell the Bible story in such an engaging way that people will want to spend hours in the museum. Steve Green's family not only runs the mega business Hobby Lobby, but also owns one of the largest collections of Bible artifacts in the world. Most will find a home in the new museum, along with many high-tech, innovative displays to bring God's Word to life. When the, we think of the word museum, sometimes you think of old and dusty, but what we will be doing is making this technologically advanced, where that it's very engaging and interactive, where that somebody could have a customized tour if they wanted to. The museum is set to open in 2017, just a few hundred yards from the National Mall and the most famous Smithsonian's, like the popular Air and Space Museum. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the future site of the Museum of the Bible. Great hat, Paul. Well, thanks so much for joining us this week. Until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye, and as always, God bless you.